Thank you. I want to, uh, as I get started, acknowledge my uh, colleague and co-author on this work, Don Hartley, who did a great deal of the GIS work I'm going to talk about today. Um, and what I'm going to speak about is the challenge of land management planning, uh, specifically with the, within the BLM. And as a lot of you know out there who work on uh, these federal land management plans, they really set the stage for um, development on the landscape and the impacts on wildlife for 20 or more years to come. And so the kind of decisions we, may, we make during um, BLM land management planning need to be smart. They need to take advantage of the best science and information we have um, as we move through them. And, but some of the concerns that, uh, that I and my organization have around um, land man management planning is that uh, wildlife research, the kind of research we've heard about today that a lot of you and others are doing in the field, um, isn't always well integrated into the land management plans. Um, and for perfectly reasonable reason is that the, what we do and format as researchers isn't always um, uh, put forth in a way that is immediately applicable in a land management plan. Greater landscape level spatial analysis, I believe, is needed. Um, to help us understand the indirect impacts. Again, something we've, we've heard about earlier in the day, the indirect and cumulative impacts of oil and gas development on wildlife species. And the proposed oil and gas development alternatives are typically presented in a land management plan, these big federal documents, um, as text and tables of information that may be very good and valuable information to move forward with, but it's hard to visualize what it means, what the different scenarios and the different alternatives in the land management plan would actually look like and what their impacts would be on the ground. And so uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is how we've tried to address these issues in the Little, Little Snake Resource Area Management Plan um, in Northwest Colorado. It's about a 4.2 million acre BLM resource area in the very northwest corner of Colorado. Um, they were going through a land management planning process between roughly, let me get the dates right, 2006 and 2010, I believe. And we, I and others in our organization sort of were walking through that process as one of the stakeholders among many other organizations trying to help um, push the use of, the, of good information, particularly around wildlife and other issues in the management planning process. Uh, it's an area that has some of the best um, relatively intact sage step habitat in Colorado um, and is home to some really important wildlife species from sage grouse, um, key habitat, um, wonderful uh, winter range for several ungulates in the region. Um, and really diverse stakeholders trying to engage in this process. And so what I'm gonna do is uh, give you some examples of how we use GIS technology to incorporate science in the process. And I'm just gonna give you a few examples over the course of these, the six years that the planning process went on. Uh, the methods we used included using GIS to construct uh, build out scenarios to illustrate graphically what different scenarios of development would look like on the ground, um, to review uh, wildlife field literature, things like what John Beckman um, and others here today have already presented, and how we try to incorporate that in with the spatial analysis. Um, you know, and based on the particular field literature we found for local species, we designed habitat mm -hmm. fragmentation and related spatial analysis to try to better integrate that science, field science, into the planning process. Um, <clears throat> the first of three examples I'm gonna provide um, during the talk is an analysis or a, a, a spatial representation and analysis of one of the early stakeholder um, suggestions. Some of the cooperating agencies suggested um, that one route to go to improve management and why provide wildlife protection was to use what's I think here at the like, top few points here are really the important ones. You know, within the states identified eight uh, sagebrush, important sagebrush patches, important for um, sage grouse and other species, um, there was a suggestion to put only 
one well pad per 160 acres. That would lead to approximately a 5% um, maximum direct surface disturbance on the landscape. Um, and uh, a quarter mile um, NSO or no surface occupancy around LEX. And so we took those spatial parameters and, um, and said, okay, well, what would that look like if we do that on the ground? And so the, um, the areas in sort of the tan color here are BLM's managed surface lands. The blue, sort of gray blue areas here, these squares are states, state lands, and the remaining white lands are primarily private lands. And the red roads and little squares that represent well pads are existing on the ground today. And the roads and well pads in yellow, but the yellow represents new roads and well pads that would occur or could potentially occur under the scenario from these cooperating agencies that had been suggested. And so this is just an illustration for a sample area of what it might look like on the ground. And if you look at some of the direct measures of direct impacts, you can see that there's an additional 142 miles of new roads. Uh, there's um, uh, 595 new wells and a total of uh, about 5% direct disturbance. That means directly disturbed ground from uh, the road right of ways, um, the roads and well pads. And we sort of simplified our, um, because of the limited information we have, we did not include some of the pipelines and pumping stations and other infrastructure that would actually raise those numbers a little bit higher, but we didn't have enough information for placement for those on the ground at the time. So um, in terms of the indirect impacts, again, you've heard a lot about these earlier in the day. Um, we looked at habitat fragmentation and saw the increase in road density from 1.7 to 2.6 miles per square mile, uh, the um, increase in the average patch size of unroaded lands going from uh, 779 acres to six, uh, down to 685. <coughs> But these are just numbers. They don't really tell us anything useful in terms of the resources on the ground. And so what we did, we took those numbers, particularly as they are calculated within particular habitat types, and looked at um, some of the impacts with, associated with specific species. And so an example from this particular study was looking at um, a sagebrush obligate bird species and um, Inglefinger, in a paper in 2001, uh, observed that there was a roughly 50% decrease in presence of uh, sagebrush obligate birds uh, within, what was it, 100 meters of a road. And we calculated, uh, under this development scenario for the study area, about 38% of the study area was within 100 meters of a road which suggests at least that there's a risk to be considered of a 19% overall decline in sagebrush obligate bird species within the study area. And so this is an example of where we tried to pull um, relatively recent information from the biological literature and tie it to some measures that we could measure with GIS about a particular development scenario on the ground before it actually occurs. We did that for other species for that analysis. But I'm gonna move on to about halfway through our work during those years. We did uh, another build out scenario um, that represented the al preferred alternative in the BLM's draft management plan. And there were a variety of parameters based on the planning documents and our discussion with the BLM, our discussion with other entities involved in the process. And we ended up with a series of parameters for the build-out scenario, included uh, over 3,000 wells to be placed throughout the 4.2 million acre resource area, the size of the drill pads and road rights of way, spacing between wells, um, these various parameters that were all spelled out pretty well in the planning documents. And a few more constraints on where development could occur were based on either um, steep slope or other kinds of lands that have been identified either through existing legislation or plans that were or statements and guidelines that were a part of this proposal. Um, 
where no development would occur. So we didn't place wells using the GIS in these regions. And so here is a map before the development scenario that shows the areas uh, where development was likely to occur. And again, this is based on parameters in, um, in the planning documents and extensive conversations with the BLM staff locally. Um, and here, this is the entire planning region and the areas in tan are BLM surface managed lands. Again, the sort of gray purple color are state lands. The light green is Forest Service and the dark green over here is National Park Service uh, for Dinosaur National Monument. And these reddish boundaries are development zones that have a specific um, development density and or number of wells associated with them that we used for the build-out scenario. Uh, and the ones in red are relatively dense. These little blue boundaries are also development zones for much more low-level dispersed development. So this is sort of our starting point. The next slide shows the actual build-out scenario. This map is impossible to show at a scale that you can put on a slide. <laughs> And so I tried to do, show a blow up here on the right that shows um, what the actual roads and well pads look like. Again, the, the roads and well pads in black are existing on the ground um, today, and those in red are, uh, or the, the well pads in red, rather, are those that would be new and uh, potential under the preferred alternative in the draft management plan. So again, this gave us a base, a framework of what could happen on the, on the ground in this particular scenario um, to then compare with wildlife information. So again, we conducted a habitat fragmentation analysis focusing largely on um, distance to road values, road density, and patch size because those are the things that we found in the biological literature could be tied to a specific response to species present locally. And a couple of examples. Um, this gets back to John Beckman's presentation earlier using some of he and his colleague Joel Berger's work on pronghorn. We identified um, that 18% of the pronghorn uh, winter range in this area is at risk for loss due to reduction in size of the patches of roads. You know, based on some of their work, um, patches uh, need, really need to be greater than 600 acres in. Uh, areas of severe winter range, uh, winter concentration areas to avoid, um, you know, a fairly strong potential for decline in that species. Similarly, we're looking at mule deer and identified that 77% of the mule deer uh, winter range in the area um, uh, is within 0.29 miles of a road, again, an area that was at some significant risk for reduced presence for mule, reduced use by mule deer in the region. And we have, you know, we did this for other species for the, at this point as well. But I'm going to move on to the third and final um, analysis I'm going to show you today, which is at the tail end of the process. Here we had just had the final management plan released and we ha also had some guidelines that had come out, some, you know, guidelines from the State Division of, I want to say State Division of Wildlife. Colorado, it's not the State Division of Wildlife, it's Colorado uh, Parks and Wildlife now. At the time it was CDOW, so my slides are old here. Uh, but this slide, essentially what I'm trying to show with this is that we were comparing different sets of guidelines. Um, on the left side we have areas on the ground with different um, parameters associated with them. We have sage-grouse lex, and this study focuses strictly on sage-grouse this time. We have sage-grouse lex, we have high priority habitat, we have medium priori priority habitat, some's leased, some's not leased, and then different uh, surface use restrictions associated with that. In the BLM's final plan, we have um, no surface occupancy 0.6 miles wide around lex, um, and similarly from the state wildlife staff. But then different um, different surface disturbance limits in terms of percent direct surface disturbance for these different categories on the ground for high, medium, and low priority habitat. And sometimes they're mandatory, sometimes they're not. We wanted to propose 
uh, as we were writing comments on the final plan, that how, what would happen if we were to compare the impact on sage grass between the BLM's final plan and um, a mandate to adopt the uh, state wildlife officials' um, suggestions for um, direct disturbance limits. And so, if we go and look at the maps, instead of showing you a map of the build out, I'm going to skip over those in the interest of time today and show you what happens if we, instead of looking at the well pads, we look at the leks colored by, based on the number of well pads that fall within two miles of those leks. And so we, here we have a map with the dark brown being high priority sage grouse habitat, uh, lighter brown is medium priority, the sort of gray brown is low priority, the remaining habitat is, is not known to support sage grouse. And these are all maps from the State Division of Wildlife. And the points on here, the green lex, the light green color, and I hope you can see those in the back, um, represent lex with 12 or less um, well pads within two miles. Uh, this has been identified by um, uh, some work by Kevin Doherty in Wyoming as a number of well pads that provide minimal impact. Um, he identified with them with minimal impact on the sage grouse. The well pad, or excuse me, the leks that have orange dots, a little bit bigger orange dots, and there are about three of them on here, are <clears throat> have 13 to 39 well pads within two miles. A uh, number of well pads that is associated associated with a more than double the rate of decline of sage grouse population, and I think that population being presence of males on leks, and so. Today, before any additional development, there are only three leks that have greater than 12 um, well pads within two miles. Under the BLM's final plan, there are 29 leks that are either yellow, this yellow-orange, 13 to 39 wells within two miles, and a handful more that are red, which is uh, 40 to 100 well pads within two miles of a lek. And at, that, at those numbers, based on, again, on Kevin Doherty's work, I would, um, we need to seriously question whether uh, that lek would be viable at all at that level of development. So if we compare this map to the next one, which would be um, a result of following the guidelines from the uh, Colorado Division of Wildlife, we are back to just three leks with um, greater than 12 well pads within two miles. And there are actually still a substantial number of new wells um, placed in this scenario, um, yet they're dispersed in a way to minimize their impact on sage grouse. And so I thought this was a, a, a nice example, a supportive exa example of some of the work of the, the biologists at the Colorado Division of Wildlife. So, I, this just summarizes what we saw in the last three slides, um, that uh, the what was out in the final plan and eventually in the record of decision um, still had substantial impact um, and put roughly 10 times as many um, leks at, at a substantial risk for um, a drop in population over what we have today or what we would have under uh, this other set of guidelines. So. What are the benefits from doing this kind of work, using GIS to both illustrate what different build-out scenarios would look like and incorporating with that some of the latest biological literature um, to help us explain what those impacts might be to different species on the ground before development actually occurs? Well, for us internally, for me, for me personally, it was incredibly helpful um, to be forced to work with some of the different stakeholders and agency personnel from the very beginning of the project to help understand what their needs were, what their guiding um, ideas or recommendations were, uh, what kind of science were they using, which we had to do before we could even build all of the different parameters and constraints that were necessary to construct the build outs in the first place. So it was a great education for us about the interests and goals of other stakeholders. Um, 
the maps that we generated and took to meetings with the county commissioners and conservationists and the BLM and state game folks and all these different parties um, were wonderful drivers of conversation and engagement with all of the people that we worked with. And so it led to more really positive conversations along the way. Um, the GIS allowed us to integrate some of the latest wildlife and field research, which made our work stronger. Um, sometimes we went in with preliminary analyses and, and so they said, oh, you forgot about that. And so we'd run back and re rearrange the analysis and change the parameters to be more realistic to what's on the ground and incorporate new science that we didn't know about. Um, we felt we were successful in convincing some of the parties and stakeholders to consider new information, to um, adopt um, you know, different guidelines or different recommendations that would be, would be more con conservative or help conserve wildlife um, better. And the f actual final management plan when all was said and done after six plus years um, was substantially, provided more, substantially more protection for wildlife than the versions that were first floated at the beginning of the process. I won't say that we acquired all of the wildlife protections that we wanted to see in the plan, but we did uh, achieve some um, better guidelines than we, certainly than we had started out with, which was great. What I really wanted to end with here was the sort of the future needs and the science. Um, there's just an incredible tie that I think everyone in this room already appreciates between the field science that's done and um, the policy that needs to be done and, and done um, by the agencies, both at the national level and through these very specific land management plans. And so, um, you know, we have some good science that we're using now that you all are using, um, uh, but there's so much more that we need in terms of understanding the response to oil and gas development and renewable development, um, and we need it from the field biologists. And so, in particular, uh, given the kind of my experience in working with the agencies and developing um, comments on these land management plans and trying to, to use good landscape level GIS analysis to inform the process, you know, I think that we really need um, more wildlife research that talks about the response of species. You know, how are, how are key species responding to um, development, be it roads, be it activity on the ground, be it the well pads themselves, you know, development phase versus uh, ongoing production phase. You know, what do we need to understand about the response of pronghorn and mule deer and sage grouse and so many other species to these various activities so that we can plan better for uh, their sustainability. Uh, I think the last one is really very similar, you know, habitat type and size needs. Some um, Joel Berger, John Beckman work on pronghorn, identifying this sort of threshold tipping point around 600 acres for habitat needs for pronghorn is, is one example and it would be wonderful to have more of those kinds of examples for other species for patch size needs. And so that's my request from all of you, those of you who are doing field work, to uh, continue that good work and um, provide it, get, get your research out and published um, so that we can all use it in the future for land management. That's Thank it. You. We have plenty of time for questions. The question is, um, were we doing it as an independent organization working with the BLM or were we requested to do the work? Um, and you know, at the Wilderness Society, uh, you know, typically our science work is done. It's driven by the staff and the needs uh, and science work that we feel is important to do. And so we, you know, we came up with the project and, and it, you know, it's a public planning process. We engaged as any member of the public can engage in, in a federal land management planning process. And so we felt this kind of work would be useful to inform that process and others. And so, you know, we had done a little bit of this work in other places and sort of further evolved it at this site in Northwest Colorado. Janice, uh, the term that you used, build out, with regard mm -hmm. to the infrastructure that's planned, can you speak to the circumstance of what the Bureau often sees 
to do land use plans, we have mm -hmm. to make the reasonable foreseeable development yeah. scenarios that will cover the certain types of density and oil and gas development. Right. What happens when they drill that out in four or five years and they come before the State Oil and Gas Commissions to downspace reservoirs that will put four, five, six, ten times the density? Uh, can you speak to that situation with regard to that? Uh, it's it's a challenge and we you spoke to the rfd and we certainly use the rfd for the little snake resource area in terms of developing the parameters for the build out and we built to those specifications used in the rfd um, with refinements based on the, the local blm staff there um, and i think it's a real challenge i mean and we we run up against it in other places where um, management plans such as the white river just to the south of this where they are you know, outstripping the last management plan. They're running through an amendment now, as we speak, um, to try to accommodate that you know, boom in development because a different type of deposit's now viable and operators want to go in and develop it. Um, you know, it's, it's a real problem when we have a set of guidelines based on X number of wells, whether it's the 3,000 and Little Snake or you know, whatever the number was. Um, you know, I, I don't have a good answer. It's, it's troubling to me if we continue to develop without going back and saying, okay, we, we need to take a look. We, we didn't realize this resource was, was economic and, and all of a sudden today it is based on new technology or prices and whatnot. Um, and I think we need to go back and then reevaluate because we might not have looked at the resources in the area um, not knowing that the development was going to occur at that level. And I think it really requires us to step back and reevaluate evaluate the situation, including the new technology and pricing, and potentially a new suite of resources that would be affected by that. Mm -hmm.